Okay, thank you. All right. Um, I would like to say thank you to Maria Jose because she was the one contacting me to come and give a, a, a talk. Although I hopefully I don't disappoint you because I'm not really into citizen science as you have been showing me. So I'm, I, I was really making a bit off here. Yeah? But I'm trying to. <laughs> so I will, I will share with you what I have been doing in terms of research and how we are trying to move that into engaging the public to move forward. So as you see my title, um, I'm part of the university. I was part of the uh, CPU until last year. I moved to Metropolitan University. But I have been working with uh, the Hong Kong Mining Ecology Association. It's rather new. Um, I, think, I don't think that more than two years old since we got the non-profitable certification order. Uh, so we have been trying to uh, slowly try to promote some programs, how we can start doing restoration with this uh, organization. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the use of oyster hook shells for ecological restoration. Uh, let me start with some boring, perhaps like more like lecture <laughs> uh, approach of biodiversity. So if you see in this map, you can see that the, the dark areas in brown are the areas that are more populated and the red line shows the hotspot of biodiversity. So it's no new that there is a correlation of where human growth uh, population grows and the and the relation with biodiversity. And but if you look at this next the next graph, you see all those red dots are the all the coastal cities that have more than one million population. And now you see the red lines, they're not biodiversity anymore. They are the, the areas that have been more affected by human impact. So there is a close relationship of human affecting the environment. And unfortunately, uh, this is not going to improve anytime soon because it's predicted that more coastal cities will become mega cities with a population of over 5, 8 million, which is going to put more stress on the environment. And if you look at again, Southeast Asia is one of the areas where we had the biggest problem with this. Uh, and because of the population growth, uh, it is, and because also because of uh, extreme weather, it is expected more coastal city will start building more and more sea walls or armor in the city to prevent this. And this has a direct impact on biodiversity. And what is expected within the next 25 years is that more artificial structure will be developed on the coastal areas, such as uh, break, wall, uh, break walls or this kind of real rough sea walls, jetties, pontoon, and wharfs. And in Hong Kong, we have the same problems. We have a lot of problems with the marine environment. One of the main problems that we have here is habitat loss and fragmentation. I think you're quite familiar with land reclamation and artificial shorelines. Bioregal invasions, as I was mentioned in the previous talk of the wetland, that there are some invasive species. We also have big problems with environmental pollution. And how it was mentioned just in the previous talk about the over exploitation of resources, but we're also exposed to climate change. As I mentioned, if you are familiar with Hong Kong, you can see that a lot of the natural shoreline has been destroyed. I mean, they're gone forever. There is no way that we can bring them back. And they have been replaced by these artificial shorelines. So although you like to walk on the promenade, we are quite familiar, even you can enjoy your walk, but this is the new landscape that we're becoming quite familiar with. And what is the problem with this? Um, there are two main types of seawalls or artificial shorelines in Hong Kong. One is the vertical seawalls, and that's pretty much like any wall that you have seen. It's a two-dimensional plane with, made with granite, rock, uh, granite blocks or concrete. And we have the other one, the root wrap, that's made with these granite blocks. And what happened with this is that we find less species living in this habitat compared to natural shoreline. And why did this happen? Because when engineers build the seawall, they're they design it with the main objective to provide coastal protection against land erosion and wave action. So they're very useful for that, no, 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 no doubt. But they have very little regard in terms of ecological impact. Um, and what happened that these seawalls are very smooth. You can see this, the surface of the surface of the seawalls are very, very smooth, and they're very simple. And you compare it to the uh, to this one, to the natural shoreline, this is very complex. You see that there are different components. You have sand, shells, different type of rocks, orientation, there is a, a gentle slope. So this helps to keep 
this add complexity that can support high biodiversity. The other problem with these seawalls is that because they're very smooth, and if you are familiar with summer intertidal habitats, usually the low tides in coconut in summer are during the day, and if the seawall is exposed to the sun, the surface temperature can easily go over 45 degrees Celsius. That means that make it very difficult for many species to survive there. And if you look at the natural, the another rocky shore, the surface is not smooth, it's, it's more complex. You have these crevices, holes, and if you look at the thermal image, you can see that there, these are like a small pocket of pool areas where species can survive because the temperature is either anywhere between 10 or 5 to 15 uh, degrees less. And the same, if you look at the surface here, you see that animals don't distribute uh, homogeneously on the surface. They, they usually search for this microhabitat where they can survive, so they can reduce the environmental stress. So what we have been trying to do in terms of research between CTU and MU is trying to find what are the patterns that can help uh, to host high biodiversity on natural shoreline and how we can put, try to retrofit this artificial structure to increase it, to fill this gap in terms of biodiversity or ecosystem function. Uh, because I said that I will be talking about shells or oysters, so I'm going to quickly go through a few projects that we have been doing in, in six sites, but I'm going to only just point few. Uh, the first trial that we started about this eco engineering trials in Confront to improve biodiversity was a uh, collaboration with the World Harbor Project in Sydney, Australia. It was a very simple experiment. We we got these three type of tiles, flat tiles, tile with mean complexity that had crevices about 2.5 cm, and, and tile with higher complexity with uh, crevices about 5 cm. And we have another set of tiles that we view like oysters on the surface. And, well, and after a year, we, we can see that the tiles were very effective. The design is very simple, but very effective in reducing the surface temperature. And that is correlated with the number of species that can live on the, on the seawall. But what was very interesting is that just by adding this light component of oyster on the seawalls, we can see that there is a high increase in number of species. What is, makes sense because oysters are bi bioengineers, so they can provide microhabitat for many different species. Following that, following that, we step into a, making a bigger experiment. So now we are trying to redesign or test few eco engineering structure to replace these big boulders, like these uh, tidal pools and armor units that have different type of microhabitat. To see, we can increase the biodiversity in these seawalls. But we also have this simple unit that is a stainless steel cage where we put inside oysters. So here we have three main components. One is the cage itself. It can provide habitat like a shell reef, but we have also some bags inside with live oyster and some bags with just shells. And this was our first one, so we didn't know what to expect. Um, so what we expect is that animals will start growing within the complexity of these shells. And what we found after 18 months is that regardless of what part of the oyster basket we were looking at, if we look at the basket as a whole, we can find that there were about three times more species compared to the normal boulders on the seawall. And this is mainly because of the complexity of the shell. Imagine putting all these shells together, make a lot of little houses for, for animals to, to live and go back and cope with this, uh, stress and also predation and so on. And, okay. and we also wanted to see, okay, can, can this community growing these shells also provide some ecosystem services like biofiltration that are very important for, for the environment? And what we found is that, yeah, the, the live oyster, original live oyster and the the community that were growing only on the shelves all have biofiltration capacities. You can see in this uh, time lapse that both of them, like oyster and just oyster shelf with epigiota, have the capacity to filter water. And this can go anywhere from 0 0.7 liters per hour to 1.4 in average, which broadly represents about between 16 and 34 liters per hour per dry, per gram of dry, dry biomass. So that's the capacity of biofiltration is quite high. So we continue with another experiment. And this was in, in Chung One. So 
So in, in G1, because I can never pronounce that right. <laughs> so here we, we start designing other features that can be more easily included in, into this type of root wrap seawall. But again, we have the interest now of keep on, on going with the shelves. So here now we don't have the cage anymore because it's very expensive to make and it's very artificial. So we wanted to see if just using this shelf that come from low and we can enhance biodiversity. So what we did here, we drill these shells, we make these colors, and we start making these small uh, shell brief units. And again, compare it with the with the boulder. Okay. And what we found again, pretty much similar result. Here we found six times more species on, on the control boulder. And this was very, I would say, we were very impressive for us for us because. In our baseline, when we were doing the service there, we found that many species were dying, and not just because of the environmental stress, but also because of pollution events in this area. So we, we were not very optimistic that we would we could find a good result, but, but yes, we did. And when we look at the community, we can see that only about seven species are shared between the two types of habitats, and, and this oyster shell reef unit can provide habitat for 37 species that usually don't appear on that seawall. So it's a, it's a big improvement. And here you can see which are the big winners, like the sponges, bible, the gastropod, barnacles, and tunicate. And most of the species are filter feeders. So they can also provide the biofiltration capacity to this area and perhaps help to uh, clean the, the harbor. Again, if you look at the, the time lapse or the time series of the number of species using the different type of um, structures. You can see that on the borders after six months, not many more species to growing on them. But if you look at the oyster, uh, oyster shell reef, the number of species keep steadily going up. So I'm pretty sure if we leave it for longer time, we'll find more and more species. Okay, so oysters for us as eco engineering, eco engineers are very important because they are very cost effective um, tool for restoration. But oysters are very important also culturally for Hong Kong and Southern China. You can see those pictures with people farming and harvesting and how shell has been used in different ways for construction, but also to produce a uh, line for concrete in the in those time. And because of that, unfortunately, if now we talk about the natural oyster reef that are as important as coral reef, most of them has been lost already. 85% of um, Oyster reef are gone. We only have about 15% left, which, which has a big impact on, on the ecosystem function and services that this reef can provide. Because these reefs are very important to provide food and natural resources for marine life, but also for humans. They can help with the provision of habitat and feedings for different organisms. They can enhance biodiversity, but they can also help to improve water quality. Via by filtration, and they also provide a uh, coastal protection. So if we are losing all this, uh, it's not that good for our cities as well. Okay, um, back then this was in 2017-18. We were very inspired by the Billion Oyster project. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's a it's a high it's a it's a high school in New York called Harbor School, that they use the sea, pretty much similar to the Harbor School that we have in Compton, that they use the sea as a platform for teaching different subjects. And they started with this project of using this carpet shell for building like this a small reef to restore bi biodiversity. And it took such a big momentum that they started getting support from different entities and restaurants are keeping the shells and giving, giving it to them for building more and more reef. And nowadays, the, the project is very successful there are a bunch of people engaged and, and the restoration process is going back. And now oysters are back in New York and really naturally. So it has been very, very successful. So because good idea has to be copied. And so we had the Hong Kong Marine Ecology Association. That I, I say it's very new, but we were inspired by building of the project by the founder who came here and started giving us advice on how to do it. So we wanted to do something similar. I mean, we have oyster farms, we have a lot of shell going discarded into the trash in the landfill, and we choose to promote restoration. So the vision of the MEA is to 
to promote a biologically diverse and sustainable marine environment for life to flourish and people to appreciate. But we also want to fight to promote a cleaner heart, cleaner heart. Uh, our goals, we have different goals like restoration, so to try to promote conservation of the natural environment, but also to promote by the restoration of biodiversity and enhance the resilience of these coastal environments. Research is our one of our mainstream as well because we need to make sure that whatever we are doing is backed up by, by science so that can help us to move forward. And at education, we want to target young generation to promote conservation and restoration ideas and also engage with the stakeholders to promote further um, the conservation of the marine ecosystem. So based on that, uh, we we only have two projects so far, uh, and still we are kind of research mode because pretty much we are all researchers. So we are not very, uh, personally, I'm not very social. You will never see me in social media. <laughs> so I'm very weak in that part, <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm very happy doing the research part. So we got funding from the Marine Ecology Enhancement Plan and Inter Interflow Foundation. They gave us support to do this kind of project, a small project, but very interesting. So the, the first objective of the project was to rehabilitate biodiversity using discarded shells uh, in different type of artificial environments, such as re rock sea walls, agricultural farms, and pontoons. And the second objective was to engage the public to do this kind of coastal restoration. And when we talk about public, mainly uh, primary and secondary students. So for this project, we had three sites. We had real rough seagulls here in, in Sunny Bay. We, we are working with the um, uh, Royal Hong Kong Jet Club in, in Coastal Bay because it's, it's highly disturbed and artificial and polluted. And we're also working with a uh, light jungle in Sokoban in Lama Island to do these trials. And of course, no prey can go any, any part if we don't have a great team. So we have a, a great team of, they're kind of half volunteer, half under the organization, but they're very motivated. And they have been very active in approaching different organizations or different schools, because for us, it's really hard. We don't have the network to say, oh, I had this program, and people will start emailing us. So we had to, they had to go out, try to talk to people, the principal, you know, we have this project and try to sell the idea to engage the kid. And even they sometimes they like it, it doesn't work that, that way because they say, oh, but they have to go to the field. Uh, it's gonna happen an accident, it's, it's some bird animals, any any kind of excuse that I didn't think that they were six, but <laughs> they do it out there, and it's very difficult to engage children. But they can they came with this program that from oyster restoration, I mean oyster collection and and all the process of building these um, oyster shell strings and going into the field, deploy them, and after that. The monitoring. Ideally, these children should be able to do all these steps except the first one. Um, they have been quite successful. With, they have uh, engaged two primary schools, nine secondary schools, and three other organizations like university and so on. So the first step is to communicate with other farmers in Lafushan. And after the harvest, we can get their shell. Um, and that's done already. We've got a lot of shelves, and we have a, a pile of shelves to do this project. And the second step is to organize these seminars. The way that it works, if for, for some primary school or for some student, they won't go out. So the team will go into the school, bring the shelf, bring the tools, and, and give these uh, seminars about biodiversity, the ecosystem, or the marine ecosystem issue that we have in Hong Kong, and how we can restore it using this show. And in this one, they have we have been able to engage uh, 195 primary students, 413 secondary students, and 118 uh, members of other organizations. The second step is fabrication workshop. So this is kind of an experience for for people. Um, and again, we can bring the tools into the into the schools if they they have the space or we can bring the student to a, a workshop that we can write. And, and this, I think this experience 
they, they keep really enjoy it. They, they're fascinated. I think there's a generation gap here because when I grew up, my father has all the tools at home that for me it was easy to, to use a drill and everything, but children here, don't, they don't do it. So they get fascinated when they feel the power of a drill. <laughs> um, and they really enjoyed it. So they have, in, in this stage, they have to pick the, the shells, drill them, and pass the, the, the steel wire in between and make their own, own shells. And they can put a tag so they can have the ownership of them. What is really important for them. We re, it was kind of an accident, and we realized that they really like ownership. Mm -hmm. this, the other step is to, to go into the field for deployment. So mostly we go to the fish rack because it's easier and safer than going to the sea walls or any other place. So here the kid had to um, pull that rope and hang them into, into the water. And, and that's it, it's very simple. And we have engaged here 75 primary students, 93 secondary students, and 80 members of other organizations. Well, well, what's very interesting here is that we have these old fish, uh, fishermen that, that they start teaching their kid how to make the knot. Because although I know how to make the knot, I don't know how to teach them. <laughs> because I know how to make the knot by, because my hand knows how to do it, but I don't know how to teach them. And, and this fisherman was really good. And you can see the, the children really enjoying this interaction with their own uh, seafood or whatever they call it. So that was, I would say, pretty nice. And after these shells are deployed, um, some of the kids had the facility going back after three months or six months. And now we collect these, these shells in the water that pretty much became a pool of life and color. So the children can really see the transformation for a, from a white shell that they build with their own hands and now how, how much life in this, is in these little shells. So it's kind of like a hotel for, for animals. And they, they really enjoy it uh, because they, I think this is common because many people are not really aware of how much life is out there, how many different forms of life. But when you get these shells out and you put in this tray, you can see all these kind of forms that you never, you, you can see in the, in the documentary if they watch the documentaries, but you can see now firsthand. So they really, really enjoy it. And especially because they had the ownership so they feel that their house brought all this life back to the sea. So in this activity, we, we well, unfortunately, we couldn't engage any primary student, but we managed to engage 100 of six secondary students and 24 members of other organizations. So in summary, uh, although our activity is very small, but we have been learning quite a lot. We managed to engage 14 organizations within the last six months, uh, 726. Uh, participants for talks and seminars about oyster and restoration, 387 participants that were engaged in the workshops for the fabrication of these um, oyster shell hotels, and 248 participants were involved in the deployment, and 130 of them were involved in the ecological monitoring. So there is a decrease with the next step, but I think for six months of trying to do this, and with limited resources and, and labor, I think it's quite, quite good for us. Um, so I would say uh, what we learned is that we can use this Oyster Safe Overseas program to enhance the environment. I think that the option is there and we can scale this up. But it has become a very good platform to raise social awareness on these children, they, they really love it. Unfortunately, I'm not in social science, so I don't know how to do this questionnaire for analyzing without bias their, their, their learning. But I think that's one of the next steps. Um, we think we have been trying to work with the industry, like the other farmers and also the fish farmers, how they can engage in this new, I would say, era. It's yet to know about what they produce, but what they can help in the environment. So I think there is a big opportunity there. And there is also this big opportunity of preserve the cultural value of this different industry, but we still have to go farther on that. Uh, there was also, there has been also some very interesting talks with the teachers, mostly from international school, that they, they said, oh, 
I, I really like the program, the children are really enjoying it, enjoying it. Can we use this as a platform for a STEAM project or a STEAM project? Where, so we, I remember we had this conversation with different teachers like social science, uh, technology, and so on. So everyone was trying to figure out how they can we can use this platform to get different information like that so that the, the kid can use it in a holistic way and do different projects. So that was very interesting. Unfortunately, we we haven't moved forward. I'm not in education, so I, I am I'm waiting from the from the teacher to do the step. We can provide the platform. Okay. And a part of education, I think promoting this kind of project, all the projects that or all the ideas that we have been taking here are very important because this help us to fulfill local but also international goals of conservation and, and restoration. So I think that is a big just to go. And hopefully we can make it larger and larger. And saying that, I would like to say thank you to the different so to the different support that we have got from the Marine College in Hand and Fine and the Interpol Foundation, but also to different organizations that have been giving, giving us a hand, lending us space or, or the laboratory to do different things. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions, please. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is regarding the different techniques that you show us at mm -hmm. the beginning for with oyster without oyster, do you remove those structure at the end? And if so, if yes, do you see a change in the ecosystem? Like, does the species decrease again, or do we continue increasing? Yeah. Okay. The answer is no. We don't remove them because it's so expensive to put them there. <laughs> so. And we talked to CDD, the Civil Engineering Development Department, and they said they said you can keep them, you can keep using it for education. That's that's fine for us because the government, Hong Kong government, is also trying to promote the kind of rate of restoration of the digital line. So they say if you can keep it and it doesn't cause any harm to anyone, so we keep it and we keep using it for different type of experiments. So you don't have any degradation on the trot or well. That's really hard to answer because the, the scale is very small. I mean, this these seawalls are kilometers long, and our child is just like 30 meters with few features. So we are mostly focusing in, in the habitat itself. So if we remove it, yeah, it, it will affect something, but it's not gonna affect the seawall. Okay. Anyone else from the audience? Okay. Thank you very much. So you mentioned that one of the aims of the sea walls is protection from storm surges, that sort of thing. Um, has there been any comment from engineers or anyone about whether this will help or hinder the protection from yeah from yes all the time <laughs> all the time because they I mean especially from the government engineers they want to implement it but they don't want to take any liability. So of course, all the other seawalls, they have all the standards to, to build them. And they, they say, oh yeah, that's good. We can we can implement eco-engineering eco and we can enhance biodiversity, but how do we know that they're not gonna collapse, that they're not gonna break? So that's why we came with the latest feature that pretty much resembled the, the boulders. So the so the the contractor who built the seawall can install them in the same way that the, the normal boulders. So that should secure, should secure the seawall so that it's not changing in the construction, not changing in the layout of the seawall. No. No one else, not from Zoom as well. So, okay, thank you very much thank again you. for sharing with us your presentation. Very interesting.